Hello everyone and welcome to the design of the space shuttle, outlining the long and winding road that led to NASA's space shuttle. In this video, we focus on the pioneering work of North American aviation, beginning with the Navajo missile system. The Navajo came about because the US Army wanted an American version of Germany's proposed A-9 rocket plane, which was introduced in the previous video. The first version of what became the Navajo, the MX-770, looked very similar to the A-9 except that it had two ramjets. It aimed to carry a 3,000 pound warhead for 1,000 miles. Eventually, the US Air Force took over and had greater demands for the Navajo missile system. They wanted one version that could go 3,000 miles with 3,000 pounds and another version that could go 5,500 miles with 10,000 pounds, essentially a ballistic missile. But this is all right after World War II and ballistic missiles weren't a thing yet. What we have here is the beginning of cruise missiles, but at this point this was a viable way to launch a nuclear weapon over long distances, even intercontinental distances, based on the German research, which uh, proposed skip that glide technologies and other ways of getting such space planes over to another continent. In order to further its development along these lines, North American Aviation realized that it couldn't just rely on the leftover German engines, the A4 engines. They had to develop their own engines, and to that end, they started the Rocketdyne Division. And the Rocketdyne Division eventually produced many, many ballistic missile engines, but also the Space Shuttle main engines, the RS-25s. So that's one direct link between this early work and the development of the Space Shuttle. But a lot of the conceptual work around these particular designs would also inform the kinds of designs that were proposed for the Space Shuttle. But anyway, to satisfy the US Air Force requirements, North American Aviation built this, the X-10. This was a test bed for the Navajo missile, for the Navajo 2 in particular. I had a little bit of trouble with uh, wiggliness on the runway here. But instead of using two ramjets, it used two jet engines. And now, a little bit further along after World War II, they had more experience with supersonic design, and so you note know, the Delta Wing, the Canards, and, uh, well, the, the entire physical nature of the vehicle is quite different from the V2 rockets and the A9 that we saw earlier in the previous video. Uh, I had a little bit of a problem getting this off the ground, as you can see and we lost a wingtip, but ultimately we got airborne and it was on its way. Earlier on in the 40s, they wanted to use ramjets because ramjets seemed simpler and more reliable. By this point in the early 1950s, uh, they figured that jets had come of age and they were a little bit more comfortable with them. And of course, the jets provide, provided more range. They had better efficiency than the ramjets did, even though the ramjets had better speed. The maiden flight of the X-10 was in 1953, and of course, it and the Navajo system overall would lead to much cruise missile development, uh, launched uh, sometimes on the B-52, but it certainly wasn't meant to be launched off a runway as this was, as the X-10 was. The Navajo missile system was to be boosted up by a booster rocket, and it was the booster's engine that Rocketdyne was working on. In addition to that, this is of course pilotless, which means that you need some way to navigate. And so an entirely new inertial navigation system had to be developed for the Navajo missile system, and that became used in other systems as well. The X-10 itself was able to sustain a velocity of Mach 2, and that was pretty good for the time. There were very few aircraft that could do that on jet power alone. I wasn't able to quite get this up to Mach 2, and that could be for various reasons, one reason being that we did lose a wingtip and that caused additional drag because we had to use some yaw to compensate for that and so the control deflection probably added some drag but also these aren't exactly the right engines the correct engines were J40s these had about the same power but maybe not the right mass uh, I had a little bit of a touch and go situation there on the shuttle landing facility. Actually, the X-10 testing was at Cape Canaveral at the skid strip, which had been um, built for the SNARK missile but was used extensively for Navajo missile testing as well. Uh, here we are landing at the normal run runway at the KSC and still going quite fast here. Overall, in its intended configuration, being boosted up, vertically launched, uh, the Navajo missile system was not very successful at all. It was quickly overshadowed 
by regular ballistic missile systems like Atlas and Titan. However, it ended up providing invaluable information about supersonic flight and, of course, engine systems and all the problems that could go wrong with a rocket system. And so it had a long legacy, even though as an intercontinental missile, it was a failure. Here is an approximation of the system as the Navajo 2. There was also a Navajo 3, which had a more powerful missile and a bigger booster. Basically, the Navajo 2 was the 3,000 mile one, and the Navajo 3 would have been the 5,500 mile with the heavier warhead variant. And you can see uh, the booster is very slim and tilted like that to counterbalance the mass of the, of the missile itself. And this is sort of a configuration very similar to the Space Shuttle eventually, where it's boosted by a rocket and it has its own engines. And I believe this is the first system of this kind that actually attempted a launch. Here unfortunately, as I attempted to ignite the jet engines, it turned out we were going too fast and they exploded. Uh, so no luck there. But in any case, we had tested this portion of the mission earlier and so I wasn't too worried about that. The next project for North American Aviation was a much more successful program. This was the X-15, launched of course by B-52. The X-15 was designed to investigate hypersonic dynamics in comparison to the supersonic dynamics that had been investigated by earlier planes on the X-10. In that respect, it was doing the exact same job that the A-9 had been supposed to do, and in fact one of its earliest proponents, Walter Dornberger, had been at Pinamunda with Von Braun and had been involved on the V2 and the development of the A9 design. From the outset though, it was clear that the X-15 would be more than simply a hypersonic research vehicle as the altitude limit for it, its intended ceiling, would be in space. The project specifications sought an aircraft that would reach 300,000 feet in altitude and possibly more than that, possibly more than 500,000, 600,000, or even a million feet. As a result, the X-15 was a candidate to put the first person in space. Actually, not only were they aiming for space with the X-15, they were aiming for orbit. In 1956, before the launch of Sputnik in 1957, the Air Force solicited proposals for orbiting and recovering a manned spacecraft. By 1958, Avco, Convair, Goodyear, and McDonald had proposed Vostok-like spheres. Air Neutronic, Lockheed, and Martin had proposed Mercury-style capsules, while Bell, North American, Northrop, and Republic offered space planes. North American had in mind a once-around flight, similar to the Silverbird skip glide concept, with an X-15 launched on a Navajo booster. This X-15 would use Rene 41 nickel alloy shingles for thermal protection. These were later used on the exterior of the Mercury capsule, but the pilot would have to ditch the plane in the Gulf of Mexico. The Air Force ultimately thought this proposal had promise and pursued it alongside the Dinosaur program, which I will describe in a later video, and a capsule launched by an Atlas rocket, what would become the Mercury program. Ultimately, of course, the X-15 only ever did suborbital flights, and that only after the Soviet Union launched Vostok 1 with Yuri Gagarin becoming the first person in space. And of course, NASA ultimately adopted the capsule method because it was cheaper and faster. And so that led to the Mercury program and the use of capsules in the NASA space programs for quite some time to come. The space plane idea, of course, never went away, and the X-15 program actually continued doing research alongside NASA's space flight programs. Scott Crossfield flew the first powered X-15 flight in 1959, and the final flight occurred in 1968. In total, there were 199 flights, and of those, 13 exceeded the limit of space set by the U.S. Air Force, which was 50 miles and of those, two exceeded the limit of 100 kilometers set by the FAI. The first flight exceeding 50 miles occurred on July 17, 1962, so after John Glenn's flight, and the two flights that exceeded 100 kilometers were Flight 90 and 91 in 1963, conducted by Joseph A. Walker. With so many flights, the X-15 was a remarkable success for an X-plane. X-planes generally did not fly quite that often, but it continually brought the information that its creators wanted about the hypersonic region. 
of the X-15 pilots to Neil Armstrong and Joe Engel became NASA astronauts after their X-15 career. Here I am trying to land the X-15 at Tampa Bay. I didn't uh, quite make it back to Cape Canaveral because I didn't fly the B-52 far out enough. And unfortunately the skids are still a problem. Also I wasn't entirely clear about the stall speed. The stall speed seemed a little bit higher than I thought and we came down a bit hard. The real X-15 did claim the life of one pilot, Michael J. Adams. It was evident to everyone that it would be easier to launch an orbital space plane from a carrier plane that could fly much higher and faster than a B-52. But could such a large Mach 3 capable carrier plane be built? While the North American XB-70 Valkyrie was funded as a strategic bomber, it was the testbed for a potential launch system for a winged orbital shuttle. It was the heaviest aircraft ever designed with Mach 3 capability, and it sustained Mach 3 in a flight in 1966 for 32 minutes. It featured the same canard and delta wing design seen on the Navajo missile, and also used a modified version of the Navajo's inertial navigation system. As a bomber system, the XB-70 had been cancelled years before its first flight. By the time it flew, it was purely an aircraft meant to provide unique design insight that only it, and no other plane since, could offer. Its existence encouraged numerous early space shuttle concepts to incorporate launch from a large carrier plane. Ultimately, increased cargo requirements as well as cross-range requirements eliminated those proposals. In the case of my XB-70 Valkyrie replica here, even though I tried my best to follow the design of the Valkyrie, we did have a drag problem, and also the wingtips which do fold down like you see there, well, they were a little bit wobbly, especially at high dynamic pressure. So that was a bit of an issue. The engines were correct, these are the XB-70 Valkyrie's engines as best as I can tell, configured properly. The dry mass of the vehicle was also correct, but the shape of the body and the wings might have been incorrect, and so that was a bit of an issue. So in the end, it was a struggle to get past Mach 1 at first, and we did ultimately get past Mach 2, but it was such a trickle, it was such a slow acceleration that I couldn't bear to wait to reach Mach 3, though perhaps eventually we would have gotten there. At some point in the future, I need to have a booster rocket on the tail of an X-15 and launch it on the back of an XB-70 Valkyrie, but for now, I'll say thanks to Dennis R. Jenkins for Space Shuttle Developing an Icon, the book that much of the information presented here comes from, and I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.